We're in Joshua chapter 23. This evening, we will be, uh, Lord willing, journeying along verse by verse, chapter by chapter, from uh, chapter 15 onward, if you're reading ahead, doing your homework. This Wednesday, we are in Acts chapter 9, the conversion of Saul, Paul the Apostle. Verse 14 says in Joshua 23, Behold, or consider this. Behold, this day I am going the way of all the earth. You know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one thing hath failed of all your God spake concerning you. All are come to pass unto you. Not one thing hath failed thereof. Joshua, 110 years old. Verses 1 and 2 of this chapter both say he was very old, stricken in age. Moses, 120. His eye was not dim. His natural forces were not abated. Good shape. But it was the day that God told him to come up on the mountain and die. Joshua was different. He is worn out. Well stricken in age. If if those two words can go together. Well stricken. Ready to pass off the scene. Calls together the children of Israel in chapter 23 and 24. And two great assemblies to give them an exhortation before he passes off the scene. To challenge them. And it's interesting, as he does, he makes an appeal, I believe, to the deeper part of them. He says, you know, with all of your heart and with all of your soul, he acknowledges that in the children of Israel, in us, there's a deeper part of our being than our intellect. There's something in us that God appeals to that is much deeper than just the mind. You know. In all of your heart and all of your soul. And the exhortation is that God is faithful to his word. He has performed everything he promised to you. But his challenge is, you know, he has to be faithful to his word. So if you turn away and you worship other gods, you worship the gods of the land that you've come into, God will also then be faithful to his word. He must. And he'll chasten you. And there's a challenge here about the blessing of God or the cursing of God. And he says to them, I'm speaking to your heart. Now, I can say that to you today, and I believe it's true. I can say that to you if you're a teenager, if you're 12 years old, or if you're 90 years old, that you know in your heart, deep down inside, you know in your heart and you know in your soul that if you serve the Lord and you walk with him, that there is blessing there, and that if you walk away from him and you live in compromise, there's trouble. You know it in your heart. You can play with it with your mind but you know it in your heart. And I think one of the dangers for those who have grown up in the church is this, you know, to come through the world, to come from a non-religious background and to be saved out of darkness. You know, all of a sudden these things are, God is revealing these things to you and you're hungry for them. You can't believe them. You're so, you know, overjoyed to be set free and you're ready to fill yourself with all of these things. One of the problems of being raised in the church is from the time you're little, you're having these things reinforced on your intellect about the gospel of Christ, about his grace, about the scripture, about prophecy, about all of these things. And I think what can happen is our mind We can worship with our intellect. Our mind can get filled with these things. And as Jesus said, people worship me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. David will say in Psalm 119 verse 11, Lord, I have hidden your word in my heart, not in my head, in my heart that I might not sin against you. And here there's an appeal to the heart. Because I think with our minds, we can play the Christian game. We can say we know what is right And yet, so often in our hearts, in our soul, in the deeper part of who we are, we know that we're supposed to be doing something that we're not. Or we're supposed to be turning away from something that we're not turning away from. And God ministers to us there. Eye hath not seen, ear hath not heard, neither has it entered in the mind of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. But by his Spirit, 
He's made those things known to us in a deeper place. Not where the human eye is, but where the eye of faith is. Not where the intellect is, but where something deeper is within us that takes hold of the promises of God. And Joshua, at the end of his life, is looking at the children of Israel, remembering the prophecy from Deuteronomy 31, that ultimately they would turn away and worship other gods and be driven through all the nations of the world. And he's looking at the children of Israel and saying, I'm ready, I'm going in the way of all the earth, I'm passing off the scene. His exhortation to them is not keep your swords sharpened, keep your chariots ready, keep the draft going, you need to keep young men in the military, you need to have your technology in place. No, 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 he knows. He saw the greatest nation in the world brought to its knees by a shepherd's staff. He saw the parting of the Red Sea. You know, I went and saw the Prince of Egypt, the cartoon, and I was flabbergasted. (laughs) The whole crowd in the movie theater was dead silent, just watching a cartoon. Imagine being eyewitness, walking through the midst of that Red Sea with the wall up on either side. He saw the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud, the manna fall, the water come from the rock in the desert. He saw the Jordan River part and stand up in a heap. Saw the walls of Jericho fall down and saw the sun stand still and the moon in the valley of Ajalon. Think of what he had seen. He knows that God is the one who would give them victory, that God is the one who is able to bless, that there's no danger with the enemy. That's not the problem. The problem isn't you need to be ready, your swords need to be sharpened. No, they had come through all of this war, the land is at rest. What Joshua says to him, the problem will always be with the heart. If your heart is towards God... And you're willing to take hold of the word of God and of his promises and live there. His blessing will continue. He'll continue to drive out the enemy before you. But if your hearts turn away and you worship other gods, there'll be no strength, military or otherwise. And he's appealing to that deeper sense. Now, we agree with that. Even unbelievers, you hear them say, you know, I had a gut feeling about that. Or I just knew that. Or I had a hunch. You know, and they confess that there's a deeper part of their being. I mean, you look at Stanford or Yale or MIT. They have departments of parapsychology where they're studying ESP and mental telepathy. And, you know, if you have a Ph.D. and you're looking at that stuff, you're brilliant. If you're a Christian and you believe in that stuff, you're a mental case. I don't know why that goes. (laughs) The Bible says that we're spiritual. And that there's something deeper within us. And that the issues of life flow forth from the heart, not from the mind. And the challenge here is to the deeper part of us. That's why we're warned, and I think it's important, not to let your heart be hardened. And the Bible always talks about that. Because we can worship with the intellect. And we can let our hearts be hardened so that we know what the Word says. We know what God wants from us. We know how He wants us to live. We have the information. Charles Swindle says we don't lack for information. We lack for doing, for obedience. Because that's an issue of a heart. That's where life is driven from, from desire, from longing, from the deeper part of our being. Joshua is making an appeal to the deepest part of them because they can't deny that. What he says is this. Behold, verse 14, consider this, think about it. This day, think about this now, not tomorrow, this day. I'm going the way of Joshua, the son of Nun. No, 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 no. I'm going the way of all of the earth. David. Dying. First Kings chapter 2. Now the days of David drew nigh that he should die. And he charged Solomon his son saying, I go the way of all of the earth. Be strong therefore, show thyself a man, keep the law of God. Everyone in this room is going the way of all of the earth. You know, but I want to finish the right way. Peter, knowing that he must shortly, he says, put off this tabernacle. I don't want to be remiss to put you in remembrance of the things of God. Paul, I've kept the faith, finished my course. 
attaching an exhortation to that. And everyone in this room is going the way of all of the earth. Sometimes it's with old age, sometimes it's with disease, sometimes it's with war. You know, we did Dottie Ham's funeral yesterday. And you know, I don't know, maybe hundreds, I don't know how many funerals I've been involved in. And it's never, ever comfortable. There's never a way to get used to it. I like weddings. Of course, there may be years of counseling after a wedding, you know. (laughs) But funerals are always uncomfortable. In a, in a way that, and, you know, and I, and I look at Adam in the Garden of Eden, and I know that if he hadn't sinned, he would have lived forever. He would not have died. And I look at Revelation 21, it says, when we're gathered home to his presence, there is no death there. There is no sorrow. There are no tears. There's no curse. What that tells me is that you and I were never wired for death. We don't have the software for it. In God's original intent and in his ultimate design, there's no death. We're not made to mix or mingle with it. But now, now we're in this pilgrimage and every one of us, we go the way of all the earth. And sometimes it seems easier at a funeral if it's someone that's with white hair and and that's lived their life and a long life because there's an inevitableness about that. Even though it's painful and you're losing someone you love, you think, well... They're not gypped. This is what's happened in every generation. Solomon speaks about that in Ecclesiastes. He says, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, the more difficult days, nor the years draw nigh when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. And life gets that way as we get worn out. While the sun and the light of the moon and the stars be not darkened, nor the clouds return after the rain, In the day when the keepers of the house shall tremble, the strong men shall bow themselves. Speaking of how that we start to tremble as age sets in. And he says, when the grinders cease, because they are few. I got a fake one on this side and an empty spot on that side. Because a fake one's too expensive. And this one, they wanted to put, drill something into my bone and leave a screw there and put a tooth on. I said, no thanks, I can chew without it. Drill something into my bone. (laughs) Heard enough getting it out. (laughs) The grinders are few. Of course, that's better, you know, as your teeth go because you're getting to the age where you're not as active. And if your teeth were as good, you'd gain too much weight. So the harder it gets to chew, the better off you are. (laughs) I know, speaking from experience. (laughs) The grinders cease because they are few. Those that look out at the windows are darkened. The eyes start to go. And that's okay because then you can't see in the mirror when you smile that you don't have as many grinders as you don't have as many grinders as you used to. The door shall be shut in the streets, and the sound of grinding is low. It goes on to describe this process of age. There's fears then in the way, and a desire is failing. Man goes to his long home, and the mourners go about in the streets. Or, in contrast, when the silver cord is loose, the golden bowl is broken, when the pitcher is broken at the fountain, that sometimes when it's a 15-year-old or a 3-year-old, it seems like such a waste. He says there's this process of aging and passing from this world, but sometimes the passing is like the pitcher being broken at the fountain. It seems like such a waste. The vessel was still good. It was filled with water, with life. There was still purpose. And yet... That's the way of all the earth. I happened to read a, a little article that I grabbed here of a, a professor in university. Some 14 years ago, I stood watching my university students file into the classroom for an opening session in my class called The Theology of Faith. That was the first day I saw Tommy. He was combing his long golden hair, which hung six inches below his shoulders. And I know it's not what's on your head, but what's in it that counts. But at that time, I was unprepared for Tommy, and I wrote him off as strange, very strange. Tommy turned out to be the atheist that was resonant in my course. 
He constantly objected to or smirked at the possibility of a God that loves unconditionally. We lived in relative peace for one semester, although at times he was a pain in the back row. At the end of the course, when he turned in his final exam, he asked in a slightly cynical tone, Do you think that I'll ever find God? I decided with a little, on a little shock therapy, I said no emphatically. I don't think you'll ever find God. Oh, he responded, I thought that was the product you were pushing. And I let him get about five steps to the door. Then I called out, Tommy, I don't think you'll ever find him, but I am certain that he will find you. Tommy just shrugged and he left, and I felt slightly disappointed that he didn't appreciate my clever line. <laughs> Later I heard that Tommy had graduated, and I was duly grateful. Then came the sad report, Tommy had terminal cancer. But before I could search him out, he came to me. When he walked in my office, his body was badly wasted. His long hair had fallen out because of chemotherapy. But his eyes were bright and his voice was firm for the first time in a long time. Tommy, I've thought about you so often. I hear you're sick, I blurted out. Yes. Very sick. I have cancer. It's a matter of weeks. Can you talk about it? Sure. What do you want to know? Well, what's it like to be 24 and to know you're dying? Well, it could be worse. Like what? Well, like being 50 or 60 and having no values or ideals. Like being 50 and thinking that booze and seducing women and making money are the real big issues of life. But what I really came to see you about is something that you said to me on the last day of class. I asked you if you thought I'd ever find God. You said no, which surprised me. Then you said, but he will find you. I thought about that a lot, even though my search was hardly intense. But when the doctors removed a malignant lump from me, I got serious about locating God. And when the malignancy spread to my vital organs, I really began banging against the doors of heaven. Nothing happened. Well, one day I woke up and instead of throwing up a few more futile appeals to a God who may or may not exist, I decided I didn't really care about God or the afterlife or anything else for that matter. I decided to spend what time I had left doing something more profitable. I thought about you and something you had said in one of your lectures. The essential sadness is to go through life without loving, but it would even be equally sad to leave this world without telling those you love that you have loved them. So I began with the hardest case, my dad. He was reading the paper when I approached him. Dad, I would like to talk to you. Well, talk, he replied. No, no, I mean, this is really important, Dad. The newspaper came down about three inches. What is it? He asked. Dad, I love you. I just wanted you to know that. Then Tommy smiled at me with obvious satisfaction, as though he felt a warm, secret joy flowing inside. The newspaper fluttered to the floor. My dad did two things I can never remember him doing before. He cried, and he hugged me. We talked all night, even though he had work the next day. It was easier with my mom and my little brother. They cried with me too. We hugged each other. We shared things that we had kept back for a long time. I was only sorry that I had waited so long. Here I was in the shadow of death, and I was just beginning to open up to all the people that I had actually been close to. And one day, I turned around, and God was there. He didn't come to me because I pleaded. Apparently, God does things in his own way, in his own time, the important thing is, you were right. He found me, even after I stopped looking for him. Tommy, I gasped, I think you're saying something much more universal than you realize. You're saying that the surest way to find God is not to make him some private possession or an instant answer to a problem, but rather to open up to his love. Tom, could I ask you a favor? Would you come to my theology of faith class and tell the students what you've been telling me? Although we scheduled a date, he never made it. Of course, his life was not really ended by his death. It was only changed. He made the great step from faith into vision. He found a life far more beautiful than the eye of man has ever seen or the mind of man has ever imagined. Before Tommy died, we talked one last time. I'm not going to make it to your class, he said. I know, Tom. Will you tell them for me? Will you tell the whole world for me?
I will, Tom. I'll tell them, 24 years old. Sometimes it's like the pitcher being broken at the fountain. But it's the way of all the earth. And everybody here is subject to that. Going in the way of all the earth. Now, what's very important about that is Joshua says, you know that in your heart and in your soul, there is a witness that the word of God is true. That not one of his promises have ever failed. You've been eyewitnesses of that. Now, you and I stand at a better vantage point because we saw Israel carried off to Assyria, to Babylon. We've seen the prophecies fulfilled. We've seen Israel restored as a nation. We stand at a vantage point of seeing much more of the fact that God's promises are true. You know, I love to go to Israel. One of the things there that you know that Jesus said of the temple, not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. And when you look in the the valley, the Teropian Valley next to the Temple Mount today, you can see where the Roman soldiers pried one stone off of another to get the gold. And they came crashing down on the marketplace. Huge stones as long as a stage, giant stones. And they're broken down there. And there's a barrier to keep the tourists away. But if your arms are long enough, (laughs) you can reach out because they're cracked. If your arms were long enough. And take a hold of a piece of one of those stones that stood there that Jesus talked about that bear mute testimony today that the word of God is true. You can sit it on your desk as a paperweight to remind you every day of your life that not one word of God shall fail. I want to challenge you. We're going in the way of all of the earth. God is so gracious in the process, not just to appeal to our intellect. And we should use our intellect. It's a gift. Imagination is a gift. But because God wired us and he understands us, he even appeals to the deeper part of us and says that his word is sharper than any two-edged sword, that it divides down in the human being and separates that which is soulish from that which is spiritual and appeals to us there. I'm going to say to every one of you that is a believer, you know in your heart you may be compromising, you may be flirting with sin, but you know with all of your heart and all of your soul that the word of God is true. You know it. And that if you meddle with it and ignore it, your life will be troubled. And how is it that we let our minds, somehow we begin to worship with our intellect, We let our hearts become hardened because that's the place of conviction. And our minds begin to tell us that those things, that I can get away with it. I'm the exception. And yet how wonderful that we know that everything that he said is true. When it's time for me to step through the veil. Now I may have some regrets. I think Moses, when he looked from Pisgah at the children of Israel ready to go into the promised land, I think he had some regrets. I bet Joshua had some regrets. I think Paul had some regrets. I think I'll regret not being, if I was going to step through that veil today, the husband that I should have been. My wife probably regrets that too. (laughs) I probably regret not spending more time looking straight into the eyes of my kids and telling them more than I have of the things of God. I probably regret not spending more time fasting and praying so that whatever people I was privileged to rub shoulders with, maybe they've been less effective than they would have if I'd have been more zealous. But I will never regret trusting 
Christ. That regret will not be there. I will never regret believing at that moment that I can step through the veil of death, close my eyes in this world, open them in the next, and hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I may say, when I hear it, but I have no regret that that's what I'm longing for. But that should not be when we decide to live our lives with a full commitment. I heard someone give a testimony in a Russian prison camp that the gun was put to their head and they asked him to renounce Christ by the time they got to 10. He said, by the time that man got to 7, the gospel became very clear to me. Accept Jesus and you'll go to heaven. Of course, they didn't pull the trigger because he was giving his testimony. But why wait till then? Because like Joshua, and like David, and like Paul, and like Peter, we have a great privilege to pass a baton to the generation that comes behind us. That our lives matter now, too. And as believers, that's an exhortation. We are going in the way of all the earth. If God tarries, we're going to face one of these scenarios. That's the way it is. You're not going to beat the odds, even if they freeze you. <laughs> be power outages you're going to thaw out, and then, you, and then you'll have freezer burn, and you'll be mad at somebody. You know, you just. I want to challenge you if you don't know Christ today. I want to challenge you on this level. I'm going to have the musicians come.